Welcome back to the channel. Today we will be going through the concepts present in Minitaire Habitation, the five build examples, the reasons for why Le Corbusier renounced to the authorship of one of the buildings, and why the project failed as a concept. I think I can already hear the rage. How dare you criticize Le Corbusier? But hear me out. I will unpack some thoughts and then we can have a discussion. But before we start, if you like architecture and you enjoy the content, please consider subscribing. Only 17% of you are subscribed to the channel and that would make a massive difference. On the other hand, we just reached 18,000 subscribers and I would never thought we would come this far. So thank you if you are already subscribed to the channel. Okay, so I will cover some precedents of the project, Marseille as a case study and some of its design fundamentals, the other unites with a special focus on the Berlin building. And to close off the video, I'll give you my opinion on why the UNITE failed as a project and what went wrong. So the UNITE was both a solution for the housing problem in Europe after the Second World War and an exploration of life possibilities in an industrial system. To understand the project better, I will give you some references both within Le Corbusier's architecture and from others that are visible and used in the UNITES. Let's start with two urban proposals from Le Corbusier. Those are the Contemporary City and the Radiant City from 1922 and 1932, respectively. And in these proposals, he uses the three main building typologies that will influence later the concept of the UNITE. We have skyscrapers, collective dwellings, and villa buildings. In this plan, for example, the skyscrapers are used for the business area of the city and they are in the center. The collective dwellings, they surround the skyscrapers and the villa buildings as the last ring of the city. One of the concepts that appears in the first building typology, which is the collective dwellings and that will be translated later into the UNITE, is the increased density and the growth of the city or the neighborhood in a vertical direction. And he does this to free space around the buildings and create green spaces and leisure spaces for the inhabitants. The second concept appears in the villa buildings and that is the inclusion of the nature in the apartment so a truly hanging garden appears in each apartment and also the relation with the landscape through those big openings. Another concept that will be appearing as well in the UNITE is that double height space in the living room that we can see over here. That same space is also visible in the Citrohan that was built in the Weissenhof in Stuttgart. It's exactly the same space that you see in the UNITE, so double height in the living room space. Another building that influenced the Unité is the Anna Monastery in the surroundings of Florence. In one of the trips that Le Corbusier did to Italy, he visited this building. And this building influenced the Unité in two ways. The first one was the communal living within the monastery. And the second one was the relation of the building with the surrounding nature and the landscape. And that is captured here in this sketch that Le Corbusier did Another concept that appeared in his urban proposals and that translated later to other projects and as well to Dunite is the separation of the pedestrian traffic and the mechanized traffic in different levels. And he also raises the buildings to free those views for the pedestrians and to make the street disappear. And that can be seen as well in the Swiss pavilion here in the picture on the right that is raised on Pilotis the same way that the Unite was. And the last reference that I will give you is this Narconfin building built in Moscow in 1930. And even Le Corbusier admitted that this building influenced his Unité d'Habitation concept. And I will go really quickly through some of the concepts that they share. So first of all is the communal services included in the building that can also be seen in the Unité. The rooftop also has some spaces that can be used by the inhabitants. Both of them stand on pilotis, so they are raised. And if you look at the section, both of them have double height spaces and spaces that overlook the living room within the apartments. So quite a lot of similarities. So Marseille as the ideal. Here is the overview of concepts that Le Corbusier wanted to encapsulate in the building in just one sketch. If you remember those urban proposals that I was mentioning earlier, where he was separating mechanized traffic from pedestrian traffic, that can be seen here as well. He also raises the building the way he was raising the city, and it's supported by Pilotis, and those two allow to free the space for the pedestrian and free the views. And 
There is no street as we know it in this proposal. Another thing that can be seen is the relation of the building with nature and the sun. You can see here the section type of the apartment and its relation to the outside and the views. Also those central corridors feeding the private and the common spaces within the building. And at last, that roof concept that is really important in the building. I will cover each one of them in a bit more detail, but really quickly as well. So all the unites are aligned north-south and you can see it over there. All the apartments, they run around that central corridor, so east and west. And the reason for this is to have views, sunlight and ventilation in all of the apartments. So the section type you can see here, that central corridor fits two apartments. And those are the ones you can see here along that corridor. And then on the south end of the building, an additional set of apartments there. So as you probably know, the modular is a system of proportions based on human dimensions, in this case, based on a 183 centimeter person. And Le Corbusier uses that system of dimensions to define all heights and dimensions within the apartment and the common spaces, and those define the dimensions of the building. So here, for example, you can see the seating heights are defined based on that system of proportions. Also the tabletop heights, 183 is the height of that person. And if that person raises the hand, it reaches 226. And that's where he places the ceiling height. And this can be clearly seen in the apartments. That's the 226 that I was mentioning in the slide before. That's how he defines the ceiling height. And also the ceiling width of the apartment is based on that system of proportions. So 336. And the three next concepts are very interlaced to each other, so I'll put them together for the video. The first one is the interior corridor, the second one commercial street, and the third one is vertical city. If you take a look here at the section, you will see that that interior corridor is feeding all the private and public spaces in the building horizontally. And also in level seven and eight of the building, there is this public street with natural light, which includes a shop, a hotel, and a restaurant as an additional equipment. Those commercial levels together with the rooftop equipment that has a gym, a pool, and a nursery create that vertical city that I was mentioning before. And this takes me to the next concept that Le Corbusier included in the building, which is the brisol ale. He designed two types of brisol ale in the building, the horizontal and the vertical one. The horizontal is present in the apartments that have a double height space. And the vertical one is present in these commercial levels that I just showed you. The bristle ale is used to control the temperature in those spaces that are hidden by the sunlight. And this next picture, you can see the construction of the bristle ale in Berlin, which is exactly the same in construction from the one you could see in Marseille. So the roof is a very important concept in the Unité de Habitación project for several reasons. The first one, it's the end of the spatial sequence of the building. Second one, it's a connection to the surroundings, views, nature, ventilation, and sunlight. And the third one, because it has a very extensive equipment that aggregates to that neighborhood life or common spaces that build the social aspect of the building. I will mark some of the equipments included in this level. Here we have a nursery. Next to the nursery is a small swimming pool. Next to that, there is a solarium. He also included a gym and even a theater there in the back. And tying all those different equipments together, there is a running track that goes around the building. So it's a very, very complete space, a very fundamental concept in the building. First of all, from the aspect of it, it has a lot of very recognizable spaces, but also from the functionality and the representative meaning of that space within the whole project. Color is a very important concept in Le Corbusier's work and the Unité de Habitación was not gonna be any different. All of the unités have colors both on the outside and the interior spaces. And Le Corbusier used his own color palette. This one he designed in 1931 and he used until 1959, the one you see on the screen. And in the case of the Unité of Marseille, 
was made in collaboration with Nadir Afonso, the Portuguese painter. So besides the concepts that I just covered, there were others like the bottle rack concepts or concepts related to prefabrication that I won't cover here, but they were really important in the building as well. So Marseille was the first unité, the prototype in the ideal. However, that ideal would never repeat. There were other four unités built in the span of around 15 years. Those were Nantes Rezé, one in Berlin, Brie and Fermini. So if I go to the next page, I created a table to have a good overview of how the unités changed a long time those 15 years and basic differences between them. So if we start with Marseille here on the left, 1952, it has 17 levels and seven streets. So those horizontal or interior corridors that I just mentioned. 134 meters by 24 by 56, 337 apartments, 23 layouts. It has a commercial street on levels seven and eight. So hotel shops and a restaurant and nursery, the gym, roof garden, swimming pool, solarium, and a run track on the roof. And it responds to that 226 and 366 for the grid in the modular. So the 366 is the grid width. Now, if I go on to Rezé, it was built in 1955. It has 17 levels and six interior streets, 108, 19, and 51.8. So the dimensions were slightly smaller, 294 apartments and 10 different layouts, no communal services. It has a kindergarten, a gym, and a swimming pool on the roof. And also responds to the same modular. Berlin, I will leave for the end. Now, Brie was built between 1959 and 1961. It can be considered the less successful unité from them all, it faces serious difficulties during the design phase and also a lot of budget cuts. And it was abandoned by its promoters and its tenants at some point. And it was in risk of being demolished as well. So it has 17 levels and six interior streets. The dimensions are very similar to Rezé. Uh, it has 339 apartments in 11 different variations, no communal services and no roof equipment. And it also responds the same dimensions for the modular. So the same modular dimensions are applied for this building. So Firmini had plans to build three units, but only one of them was actually built. And the inauguration date was 1967. So after Le Corbusier had passed, it has 19 levels and seven interior streets, dimensions 131 by 21 by 56. So basically the same dimensions as Marseille, has 414 apartments, 32 different variations. It has a nursery school in levels 18 and 19, and also a roof garden on the roof. And it follows the same modular that I showed you for the other ones. So 226 and 366 for the grid, not for the apartment. And at last we come to Berlin. Berlin was inaugurated in 1957. So I'm going back in time here. It has 17 levels and nine interior streets. 141 by 23, almost by 53, 557 apartments from the initial 530 that were planned. It has five main tight apartments, commercial space in the lobby. So I included it here because there is a small newsstand shop in the lobby. But if you compare it with the Marseille unit, there is no commercial level here and also no equipment in the rooftop. And the modular in this case was modified to 250 and 406. So that was the ceiling height and the width. So what were the reasons exactly for Le Corbusier to remove the building from its complete works? So first of all, some budget constraints and those budget constraints affected the rooftop equipment that I just mentioned. There is none here. It has no commercial levels as well, but the vertical brie soleil present in Marseille in those commercial levels is still present here as well, but it's linked to the single height apartments. So there is a disconnection between the brie soleil and the actual function that it does. It also has a modified modular due to the German regulations that I just mentioned, increased height of the apartments to 250 and increased width to 406. And it also, this unité has modified plans and the apartments. So there is more single height apartments and less double height apartments. If you look at it here, you can see that those two apartments interlaced are only happening on the upper levels of the unité. And the firms that built the building were actually too competent, apparently, because the finish of the exposed concrete was too fine and it didn't have enough texture, according to Le Corbusier. He called it licked by Tom Poole. 
All these factors together made him renounce to the authorship of the building and even at some point remove it from his complete works. Now, this would be really surprising if it wasn't for Le Corbusier, because Le Corbusier was somebody that used to edit himself from time to time and he had already removed some projects from these complete works. Like, for example, at the beginning of his career, he removed some of the buildings that had uh, those arts and crafts or human steel references. And he started basically from the more mechanized and industrial solutions present in the Citrohan house, for example. So would I say that this unité is not an unité? Definitely not. It's a bit reduced in concepts and not so complete as the Marseille one, for example. That's undeniable, but it's still at the same level as the other four. Now, if we go on to the next slide, we will see that they had big plans for the unités. There were plans for 33 other unités, most of them built in France, but there was one in Switzerland, a couple of them in Spain, one in San Francisco in the US, and also one that was temporary. And none of them were built. From all the plans that he had, he only got to build five unités in the span of those 15 years. Okay, so what's my take on these concepts? Let's start with the modulor. If you remember from the explanation earlier, I mentioned that the modulor is a system of proportions based on human dimensions, based on a 183 centimeter person. And that system of proportion defines all the chair heights, table heights, window heights, door widths, ceiling heights in the building. Those define the dimensions in the apartment and those define the building dimensions. Now, my problem with this number, the 183, is that the modular was done in 1946. Until 1946, the person height that Le Corbusier had selected was 175. But if we take a look at the height statistics from France in 1940, we can see that the average height in the country was 171.7. And actually in 1950, that average height went up to 173. So there is a disconnection between the actual average height of the person and the selected height that he did for the modular. Now, I was looking for some reasons for why he selected 183, and I found a couple of quotes where he was talking about the modular. The first one is, in English detective novels, the good-looking men, such as policemen, are always six feet tall. So if that is an explanation to define 183, I'm not sure about it. Uh, the second explanation that I found, or the second quote by him, the right to adopt the height of the tallest man so that manufactured articles should be capable of being used by him. Now, this is a better approach, in my understanding. The problem is that you don't take the tallest user to define chair heights and table heights, but the average user of the building or the specific user of the building. In this case, I think it's very good to take the highest or the tallest user for the ceiling heights, for example, or the door heights or the door widths, but not for the chair and the table heights. So there is still a disconnection there in the approach from the system of dimensions to the end user, in my understanding. Here you can see the plans of the apartment section type. And in my opinion, the modulor in four of the five unites is too tight. As I mentioned earlier, the modulor in Berlin, which is slightly increased, it favors the living conditions, actually. In general, the apartment, if you look at it, it's a 366 apartment by 25 meter long. The ceiling height is a 226. If you compare it with current norms, it's definitely too low. But at the time, he also received some criticism for selecting the dimensions he did. I know that these buildings are focused on efficiency and they were trying to solve a bigger problem here. But I think the dimensions that he defined for the apartments, they are still too tight. Now, if you remember my Villa Savoie video that I did, there was a chapter in that video where I was mentioning that he was a man of contradictions. And here there is no difference. I looked for a couple of quotes from Le Corbusier and he says, the modulor key to every dimension of the huge building. But at the same time, he also says to hell with modulor. When it doesn't work, you shouldn't use it. So there is those two sides in this concept as well. And I think it translates very well to all his work because it reflects the way he was basically. 
Now, if I may go really quickly to the section type of the apartments, you can see here on the screen that I have that central corridor that fits the two apartments around it. So one corridor fits three levels, and this is known as the E section. So we have an upper apartment and a lower apartment, and they are in theory symmetrical, or they complement each other, but they are actually anti-symmetrical. And there is a functionality difference between the two apartments, really clear. So the access to the apartments is in both cases through the public spaces of the apartment. So next to the kitchen, goes into the dining area, and then it goes into the living room and that double height space. Now, the difference with the lower E apartment in this section is that the access is through the kitchen or next to the kitchen again, through that dining room. But to access this living room space, the double height space, you have to go down and out. And that's not really a problem. The problem is that you have to go through the master bedroom space to access that double height space. And if you consider this space instead, all the master bedroom, you have the dining area of the apartment overlooking the master bedroom. So I think it's a bit odd, this decision. For sure, Le Corbusier was aware when he made it, but there is some functionality difference between the two apartments. So regarding the natural light, natural light is quite a big concept in the Unité for Le Corbusier. He wanted all the inhabitants and in all the apartments to have access to natural light, but that didn't happen to the common spaces or these horizontal corridors that he had in the section. And if you remember correctly the plan, we had that central corridor feeding both apartments, left and right or east and west, and an additional set of apartments on the south. But the north end of the building had no apartments. The reason for why he left that facade completely closed was the aggressive north winds that the building was hit by. And I would accept that decision if there was some natural light coming in to the central corridor from any other points. But in this case, there is none. And those corridors, if you remember the dimensions of the building, they are around 120, 130 meters long. There was no need for leaving this facade completely closed, in my opinion, he could have opened the skylight to bring some natural light in from that point or a double wall or some kind of technical solution. If we take a look at the staircases, those points, they even have more natural light than the central corridor. I still don't understand why he made that decision and he left the north facade completely closed. He could have brought some natural light in from that point without sacrificing anything in the concept of the building. Was the project a failure? In my opinion, we have to look at it in two ways. If we look at it from the urban planning and as a solution for the housing problem in Europe in the 50s, it definitely was a failure because the buildings didn't achieve what Le Corbusier expected them to achieve and it wasn't accepted by the inhabitants and by the public the way he expected them to be. And at the same time, it wasn't a one solution fits all problems the way Le Corbusier planned it. Also, this vertical city concept or the vertical neighborhood concept that Le Corbusier applies in the building didn't translate the way he wanted it to. And if we take a look at current trends in the cities, we actually went the opposite direction. We are rebuilding and repurposing current spaces and improving the living conditions in the city, in the current spaces that we have, instead of building from scratch something new and going away from the street and the neighborhood. If we take a look at it from the innovative and technological side of the buildings, they're definitely not a failure. I'm actually amazed that we have these five buildings with us today, that we can admire them and we can see all the technical solutions and the innovations that he put together just in one building and how these buildings influenced the architectures that came after and all the solutions that came after cannot be measured. So the impact of this building is enormous in today's architecture. And this is all for today. I really hope you enjoyed today's video. Please consider subscribing and drop a like and a comment down below. I will be going through your comments and I'm really looking forward to see what you guys think. I hope to see you all in the next one. Thank you.